cluster where essentially you put it in, essentially you put the binaries on tum in tumble dry, so they come out with an isotropic uh, distribution of spins. And that was all well and good until we got our first 10 binary black hole spins, and they're all basically zero. <coughs> so uh, that sucked. Um, but this does have an interesting sort of caveat to it. There's two reasons these could all be zero. The first is that the black holes have large spins, and they're just lying in the plane, so when you project them onto the orbit, you essentially get zero. The other option, which people have started to explore more and more, is what happens if most black holes just are born with very low spin. What happens if every time you collapse a star into a black hole, it manages to dissipate all of its angular momentum, and essentially gives you a Schwarzschild-like solution. Now in that case, if I get rid of the spins, the the emission of gravitational waves is essentially isotropic on the sphere. Or not on the sphere necessarily, but at least isotropic along the symmetry axis of the binary, so axisymmetric. And in that case, this distribution of very high recoil kicks gets shifted down significantly. In this case, the only asymmetry in the system comes from the mass rate, the difference in the masses between these two objects. And since you typically will exchange into binaries with near equal mass ratios, Star clusters actually tend to form near equal mass binaries as well. So you can get a lot of binaries with very, very low kicks, as low as like one or even a few kilometers per second. And in that case, you can retain these merger products in the star cluster. Now once they're in there, they can find themselves another partner, create a much larger black hole, and essentially merge again. Now to, to introduce a bit of nomenclature, which I stole from Divina Gerosa, We've essentially started calling these different generations of black holes. The black holes born from stellar collapse, we've been calling first generation black holes. Black holes born through repeated mergers in a dense star cluster, we've been calling second generation black holes. Now, would the second generation have a spin because of the orbit? They would. Yes, so then you should see that signature. Exactly. So that is one interesting thing, though. Even if all black holes are born non-spinning, you still create spinning black holes through these successive mergers. So, um, this is coming from a paper that just got accepted a couple of months ago. And we were basically looking at different populations um, of binary black holes from star clusters as a function of black hole spin from stars. And so what I'm showing here on the, on the x-axis is essentially what um, different universes for black hole initial spin. So what if all black holes are born with zero spin, or spins of 0.2, or spins, I should not touch that, or spins of 0.5, and what fraction of mergers are actually, that we would detect in LIGO, are actually coming from one first generation plus second generation mergers. And if every black hole from a star is born with zero spin, it, you've almost got about 14% of all black hole binaries from star clusters are actually second generation mergers. I can also crank this up and ask how many of these are second generation plus second generation. And in that case, the numbers are much lower. Um, even if all the spins are zero, you only get about 1% of all mergers. But it's still a non-zero effect. Yeah? Where does Sky cut off the 0.5? Because uh, that's where I stopped with the simulations. Um, Is there some weird thing where you Sky equals actually cannot get to 1? Um, I think you can't. I think there are some theoretical limits for how you can, can't can spin up. Um, and I think Ramesh might be the person to ask about this. But you can't spin up a black hole above a certain amount. Essentially, you can't accrete above. You can't accrete above 1. And I think you can't get up. But that's uh, 0.9. And it's, yeah. Very yeah. it's extremely high. It's very, it's very close yeah. to one. Yeah. In so. practice, the reason I stopped this at 0.5 was because essentially above this, you're kicking almost everything out of the cluster. So 0.7 and 0.9 are going to look essentially the same because at that point, everything's getting thrown out of the cluster anyway. Um, there are people that believe that the black holes in some X-ray binaries have curve problems of 0.7, right? Mm -hmm. So if that were the case, that uh, yeah. Would not be so positive for the dynamical scenario. It wouldn't. So um, I can see why you're coming up. But that's lower mass black holes. So yeah. In binaries. I mean, it's debated, yeah. right? It's yeah. Yeah. yeah, they're interacting, so, so yeah. they're gaining mass from accretion. Yeah. Right. Yeah, but you can't spin up. Correct me if I'm wrong. You can't. You don't have enough time to spin up an LMX to be to a spin of 0.7 from like zero, right? Or, it, no, it's not a time argument, but it's a. It's yeah. That's, that's a whole different discussion. Mm -hmm. that we should it is. Yeah, it yeah. also yeah. gets us <laughs> into an yeah. argument with the LMX B people that I really rather not touch. If we, if we instead ask, what is LIGO going to see, then it turns out about 20% of all the detections, um, if you reweight essentially these results by the ligo virgo sensitivity function, should be from second generation mergers. Um, and we can also ask, what do the masses look like? So in this case, I'm plotting up the total mass distribution of everything coming from star clusters. So this is mass one plus mass two. 
Um, and I'm showing the actual distribution in the local universe, so that's redshift less than one, which is take LIGO's horizon. Um, and then I'm showing the actual detected distribution. Essentially, I've convolved this with LIGO sensitivity function. Um, and on the right, because this is the detection distribution, I can also show the, um, the various LIGO detections and their associated error bars. Here's the 10 LIGO Virgo detections from 01 and 02. And here are the seven claimed candidates from, the, from an independent analysis that the Institute for Advanced Study has been working on. Um, and if I break this down into different contributions, um, the first generation mergers, those things born from stars, um, pretty much cover most of the low mass region, all the way up to 80 solar masses, so about 40 plus 40. The one first generation plus second generation um, go somewhat higher than that, from about 40 up to about 140. And second generation plus second generation go from about 60 solar masses all the way up to about 160 solar masses. Convenient that. Um, but this is very dependent on the initial spin. Sorry, I started going there just a little too early. So this is assuming every black hole born from a star is born with identically zero spin, so born identically Schwarzschild. As I dial up the birth spins from black holes and assume universes with higher and higher birth spins, this contribution decreases. So this is 0.2 see that there's much lower contribution filling this very high mass region. And by the time I'm up to a birth spins of 0.5, I've got very, very few objects in this regime above about 85 solar masses. Um, which makes sense, right? If I have higher birth spins, I retain fewer of these merger products in the cluster, and the really heavy suckers that I need to get up to 80 or 100 solar masses are just no longer there to participate in these encounters. They're flying through the galaxy doing their own thing. And I can look at the spin distribution, too. So if, chi so if every black hole from a star is born with zero spin, I still get black holes that have significant detectable spins. So this is assuming every black hole from a star has identically zero spin, and the chi effective distribution, that is, this is that parameter detectable by LIGO, still has significantly high values. And this is because every time I merge a black hole, I convert that orbital angular momentum into the spin angular momentum of the remnant, and then suddenly when it merges again, I can detect that in LIGO. Now, just looking at this, right, you can see that, I, um, for instance, you could explain just about everything that's been claimed as a detection so far. The one exception to that is this extremely weird IAS event, which is, frankly, difficult for just about everybody to explain. Um, well, almost <laughs> everybody to explain. Um, <laughs> this one is actually, I think, one of their least significant ones. I don't remember the SNR, but it's prob its false alarm rate is like one in a year or something like so that. Maybe it's wrong. Yeah, the thing is the IAS group was really looking carefully at very marginal events. Um, and I know some of the LIGO people tend to get a little salty about how they define their false alarm rates. Um, I will leave that for somebody else to talk about. But I think some of these are pretty solid detections is the, is the sort of vibe I'm getting talking to some of the LIGO people, but not all of them. Um, but I'm not, really in a, I'm not really knowledgeable enough to say which ones are which. But if I dial up the birth spins, all right, I've got a couple minutes left, so I'll try to rush through this real quick. You know, suddenly this contribution from the black holes from stars gets wider and wider, but the contribution from these second generation mergers goes away, which is exactly what you'd expect. Again, you're retaining fewer of these second generation mergers, but eventually the spins from your first generation, those born from stars, will start to dominate. And now people have looked at whether or not you can pull these two populations apart, whether or not you could do for instance, some very clever Bayesian hierarchical modeling as a way to figure out what the different contributions from these two are. This is a nice corner plot from, or triangle plot from uh, Davida Jaros and Emanuele Berti, where they show that with 100 detections, roughly, you could tell the difference between 1G and 1G versus 1G and 2G and 2G and 2G, and figure out exactly what those contributions are. Also, take a look at this paper by my Fischbach, Dan Holson, Ben Farr, Will Farr, sorry. Um, uh, which essentially does something different. What I've been looking at, though, is whether or not, instead of you doing the full Bayesian problem, there's just some unique property to these things you could immediately look at and say, yep, that's, that's definitely a second generation merger. And for that, you have to look at the pulsational parent stability. It turns out we think there is a region of, a region of the black hole mass space where black holes simply should not be able to form from stars. Um, and so let's say I have a, a real big uh, low metallicity star, about 150 solar masses. Now as this thing evolves onto the giant branch, it's gonna, you know, the envelope is going to swell, the, the core is going to form and contract, and you have this core that is dominated by a few heavy elements, um, uh, helium, carbon, oxygen, silicon, all that good stuff, 
and, in, and critically, has a large amount of very high energy, high temperature photons. Now, if I have a helium core mass roughly from about 40 to 65 solar masses, it turns out I get to this level where essentially the, the energy in the photons is so large that I spontaneously start what's called pair production. I'll start sp spontaneously converting high energy gamma rays into positrons and electrons. Now, when this happens, I've essentially taken a bunch of the energy that's being used to support the center of the star and converting it to the rest mass of these objects. Another way to think about it is I'm essentially subtracting photon pressure support from the core of this star. And without those gamma rays to, to hold everything up, suddenly the core contracts very dramatically and you start burning much heavier elements. Instead of just burning helium and carbon, you can actually start to ignite oxygen and even sometimes silicon. When that happens, you get a massive burst of energy. The star rapidly re-expands it and loses essentially enough energy It'll essentially continue losing energy until those pulsational pair instabilities are avoided. And so that puts essentially a limit on the black hole mass of about 45 solar masses. Now this is if you have a helium core mass between 40 and 65 solar masses. If you crank it up even larger to about 65 to, depending on who you ask, 135 solar masses, the explosion is so large that essentially it leaves nothing behind. Um, this is what we call a pair instability supernova. Um, They've never been observed, to my knowledge, no, um, although there are a few claims. Well, this Thursday, there would be a report about it. Uh, I mean, th th there was a press release from the CFA. Oh. They detected the It's claims still, I would say. That. Okay. Well, but that's what they report, do you think? Yes. Cool. Yeah. The group of people there. Yeah, so ah, okay. Cool. Um,